Hi, and welcome back to Gemini Network Open Live. I'm Seth Truger, Digital Media Editor for Gemini Network Open. And today we've got a special guest uh, host today. So Angel, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Dr. Angel Desai. I am a infectious disease specialist, but right now I'm doing a one-year Fishbine editorial fellowship with JAMA, which is essentially an opportunity to learn about medical editing um, and everything that goes behind the scenes of uh, the journal. Great. Well, welcome, Dr. Desai. Thank Wonderful you. to have you here. Um, so first paper we're talking about today is the association of severe hyperoxemia events and mortality among patients admitted to a pediatric intensive care unit by Ramgopal and colleagues. And we've got senior author, Dr. Chris Horvath, joining us. Welcome. Thank you very much. Great. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what you did here in the paper. Sure. Um, well, I'm an assistant professor of pediatric critical care at UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh. Uh, and I also head um, uh, our research initiatives within the Division of Critical Care, looking at our electronic record data. Um, and we have uh, a growing repository of EHR data for now 10 plus years of pediatric ICU encounters at our institution. And we set out to use these data to examine whether there was an association between exposure to uh, severely elevated levels of hyperoxemia um, and mortality uh, within the patients that we take care of. Uh, so we conducted an observational uh, retrospective study um, examining for associations between uh, uh, exposure to oxygen that led to blood gas uh, levels with uh, greater than 300 millimeters of mercury, um, uh, arterial oxygen content, and uh, and death. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Uh, you know, hyperoxemia has been a, I, I think, pretty popular topic as far as a, I guess, newly identified potential dangerous risk factor in the last probably what, at least seven years or so, maybe a little longer. Um, uh, and to me, it's fascinating. It looks like you had what was it? Uh, about 6,200 patients um, who had the measured PaO2 level and um, and yeah, had between one and three hyperoxemic events. And what did you find here? Sure. So um, of, a, of a cohort that was more than 23,000 uh, children, you're exactly right that we had 6,250 who had arterial blood gas uh, measurements that are obtained over a 10-year period. And we looked at a couple of things. Uh, we looked at one, if any exposure at all to oxygen that led to an arterial oxygen content greater than uh, 300 millimeters of mercury was associated with uh, mortality. And then we looked to see if there was a biologic gradient or a dose response, meaning did the odds of death increase with increasing exposures to severe hyperoxemia? Um, and then we did both of these analyses adjusting for the magnitude of organ dysfunction uh, using a modification of the pediatric logistic organ dysfunction score two that we constructed entirely from uh, the electronic data that we have available. Um, and what we found was that in univariable analysis, there was an association. Uh, patients who had just a single exposure to severe hyperoxemia uh, were at increased um, uh, risk of dying during their hospitalization. Um, and then we actually found a stepwise increase in death with additive exposures to severe hyperoxemia. And this held true after we adjusted for a measure of organ dysfunction that we actually calibrated to our institutional outcomes across the 10-year 10, uh, 10 cohort. And um, I, I really thought that the this dose response is very interesting. And I, I wanted to ask you just um, whether or not the idea behind this was sort of the more values that a patient um, had sort of had to do with or was a, a, um, a predictor of potentially um, if the children were sicker, for example, if that was sort of a marker for that. Sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the advantages of having these large repositories of electronic record data um, is that we have the uh, opportunity to gain um, insights uh, um, to our clinical practice um, that might allow us to, to modify things moving forward or at least offer avenues for additional study. Um, but there's limitations to observational data as well. So the, the rationale for evaluating whether a dose response relationship exists was that it was one step closer to examining whether there's actually a causal relationship between ox, uh, hyperoxemia and, and uh, mortality. Um, you know, however, there, there's uh, clear limitations in the, uh, um, just by the uh, design of the study in that it, it is observational data. So um, it's uh, impossible to completely disentangle whether those patients were exposed to high oxygen levels uh, because they were sicker 
or were they made sicker because they were exposed to high oxygen levels? Um, and that's a question that's going to need to be answered uh, with a prospective study design. Yeah, teasing out this sort of stuff is always fascinating to me in, the, in these bigger observational studies. Um, you know, some of the th one of the things I found really interesting was how uh, the overall PICU mortality rate was about 2%, um, but in the patients who had PAO2s measured, the mortality was three times higher, about 6%, um, which just shows you that people, you know, kids who are sick enough to be in the PICU and then also get the ABGs are definitely going to be sicker than other kids. Uh, that's exactly right. You know, we only place arterial lines uh, uh, when patients um, uh, are in the, the sicker end of the spectrum uh, of those that we take care of because there is an invasive element uh, to our arterial line placement. Um, so as you, um, as you stated, uh, the, those patients were at higher risk of death anyways. Um, but to account for that, we did uh, use this measure of organ dysfunction and uh, uh, were able to, again, calibrate it to the illness severity that we see at our institution um, so that we had uh, well-matched observed predicted mortality um, uh, using this, this, uh, this measure of illness severity. Um, and even after adjusting for that, that measure of illness severity, we're still seeing a, a relationship with oxygen level. So that, that may mean that uh, um, uh, hyperoxemia, again, is, is um, uh, uh, causative, um, or it may simply mean that it's confounded by some other factor, such as clinician's assessment of the severity of illness that's not completely captured with the organ dysfunction score. Um, so it's certainly an area worthy of future study. And could you explain the sensitivity analysis that um, your group uh, underwent in terms of looking at unmeasured, potential unmeasured binary confounders out there that weren't accounted for in here? Sure. Um, so again, because this is these are observational data, um, we wanted to get at um, just how strong was this relationship that we were observing with our pr uh, primary analyses. Uh, so we conducted a sensitivity analysis where we essentially looked at what would the um, uh, what would an unmeasured confounder that we did not incorporate into our current models have to look like so that we no longer saw a significant relationship between oxygen exposure and mortality. Um, and so what we found was that uh, uh, for an unmeasured confounder with an odds ratio of two, which would represent its effect size, would need to be present in 37% of the um, encounters with severe hyperoxemia and 0% of those without in order for our results to no longer be statistically significant. And we comment in the discussion that that could mean that there's potentially a single confounder that we didn't account for, although we were racking our brains and couldn't really come up with one. Um, but we admit that this could be an aggregate of other factors that are common across an entire ICU stay um, that's represented in the sensitivity analysis. And so, um, again, I think that uh, um, there was this, uh, the, our findings certainly um, uh, made us pause and, and uh, assess the potential uh, deleterious effects of oxygen exposure in our patient population. And uh, we um, are, are careful to state that you know, I think the safest approach when you're caring for critically ill children is likely to target appropriately physiologic levels of, of oxygen based on our results so far. Um, uh, but, you know, there are certain subpopulations where there have been signals in other um, literature, such as traumatic brain injury, to suggest perhaps there's a benefit in some patients for super therapeutic levels of oxygen. And so we can't draw too firm of conclusions at this point, um, but are certainly eager to study it uh, in more detail mm -hmm. and in different designs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that was a perfect segue. Uh, a, a few weeks ago on Twitter, uh, one of my Twitter friends, S. Pyogenes, sent me uh, these tags that someone had sent him where they, they would hang on their oxygen tents or their oxygen trees to target SpO2s uh, to target patients at. So uh, we'll show the picture here. And it, it, it just, it's one of those things where, again, this, we don't have amazingly perfect data in RCTs that show this stuff works. But just to kind of you know say, you know what, this is a patient I wanted 92, 96, put it on there. Anybody who's in the room looking at the monitor, just in the oxygen that targets for you right there instead of just like I don't know we should give them oxygen but not too much <laughs> yeah that's right yeah I think it I think um, uh, it potentially reflects the need for precision um, uh, in everything that we do and oxygen is again the most widely used therapy in the intensive care unit and uh, these these data would suggest that you know we need to um, uh, not take it too lightly uh, when we're using it yeah absolutely yeah. anything else mm -hmm. yeah all right great any final thoughts uh, uh, no, I think um, uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity for for further investigation here, um, and and we're looking forward to uh, to different avenues of research that these uh, these data have opened up. Great. Absolutely, well, keep up the great work. Uh, thank you for submitting the paper to Gemini Work Open, and thanks for joining us today.
My pleasure. Great. Well, moving on to our next paper, we're going to talk about the prevalence of deep surgical site infection after a pair of periarticular knee fractures, systematic review of meta-analysis from Norris and colleagues. So, uh, Dr. Desai, tell us about the paper a little bit. So this was a systematic review and meta-analysis, um, and essentially the authors looked at um, a couple of questions, but the main question was, what is the prevalence of deep surgical site infections um, in the setting of a periarticular knee fracture? Um, and they found that um, their estimate ended up being about 6%. Um, and, you know, if you look at the literature um, right now, a lot of these are based off of observational studies. And so the prevalence is really kind of all over mm -hmm. the place. And so this was kind of a, a nice uh, targeted number. Um, and they found, in addition, that about 2.5% of these um, infections were actually associated with septic arthritis. And mm -hmm. so um, infection of the inner articular space, essentially, um, or the joint. Um, and so, and you know, a couple of other things that they that they ended up looking at were some of the risk factors that were associated with developing an infection. And there's a um, a nice list of them there. And Figure three, I think, um, mm -hmm. kind of breaks down the different risks. And as an infectious disease person myself, I appreciated them. <laughs> yep. um, uh, particularly if you look at um, open fractures and compartment mm -hmm. syndrome, which is right. something that we don't always think about. Yeah. This is one of those things where I love it, where I hadn't really ever thought about it out loud, but it, it's to, it's always nice when results kind of resonate in a plausible way Absolutely. in a study like this. And, uh, you know, we saw it in figure, it's, you know, th there were a couple other things. It was um, smokers, diabetes, mm -hmm. and men who had higher rates, but the biggest risk factors were uh, compartment syndrome, like you said, with the odds ratio around four mm -hmm. uh, or higher, and um, and then deep surgical, uh, sorry, the open fractures, which makes sense. I mean, that's yes. totally true. Yeah. You, you open up, you, you have bone breaking out of this place where it's mm -hmm. supposed to be in contact with the outside world. You know, if I can see your bones with visual spectrum light, that's usually a bad day for a couple yeah. people. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that that's rough stuff. I was also just really impressed methodologically. Mm. Most of the time when I see observational uh, systematic reviews and meta-analyses, there, there's, you know, like six or eight studies. In it. They had 117 different studies, yeah. um, which covered, what was it, 11,000 patients. Um, which is pretty impressive. Absolutely. So, so, you know, especially since this isn't an intervention, this mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, they're, they're showing us prevalence here, um, that this data is really useful. I think we're really indicative of, of what the burden of the problem is. Definitely, absolutely. It was nice to see sort of a number that was um, that was associated with it. Of course, yeah. I, you know, I think that it's everybody, but right. um, clearly that's not the case. Right, because you see the needles, not <laughs> right, the haystacks. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, the other thing that I appreciated is that they also looked at, um, again, this is a bias of mine, but they looked at the microbiology as well, mm -hmm. um, and they found that the majority of infections were MRSA, methicillin-resistant, Staph aureus, and methicillin-sensitive. Right. Words, which I think really makes sense yep. intuitively. Um, yep, dangerous skin flora, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I also found it was interesting how many of these were uh, tibial plateau fractures. Yeah. Um, it's seventy of the studies were in tibial plateaus. They had uh, eight thousand patients with tibial plateau fractures. Mm -hmm. That is a lot of tibial plateaus. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, I'm, I'm a simple ER doc. I know tibial plateau <laughs> fracture bad. Um, yeah. But apparently, you know, they, they had a slightly higher rate of infection than the other the other ones. And, it, it, you know, I don't know. I'm not a surgeon, but it certainly makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, this is really good stuff. I, I don't know. I really like it. It's also it's always nice to hear um, specialists with a lot of expertise just kind of talk about their work here. And the, the description of, you know, the knee has complex anatomy. A lot of things need to happen. Mm -hmm. A lot of things need to open up um, and, uh, and things to fix to get people walking again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So interesting stuff. So let's move on to our table of contents rundown. Uh, we got a couple of people who joined us: uh, Peter Bachman, Coltrans, Lee Boy, and Jay Martin. So welcome. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining. So first off, we've got another little summary editorial from Steve Bradley and some colleagues. He's one of our associate editors here at JAMA Network Open. Um, where we've had a bunch of papers uh, that were published in the last uh, year or two on physical activity, fitness, and cardiovascular health. Um, so they kind of summarize and synthesize uh, some of the findings. We've had interesting things. Some really popular ones have gotten a lot of lay press coverage on stress tests as a marker of general fitness, mm -hmm. um, push-up capacity in firefighters, again, as a marker of cardiovascular fitness. Yeah, I really like that one. <laughs> everyone, everyone likes news about firefighters. It's I always know. <laughs> and I was surprised that they could achieve 40-plus push-ups as yeah. well. <laughs> firefighters, they have to do a lot of stuff. They got to carry around That's the big true. tanks and stuff. I mean, I've never put on a firefighting suit, but I've, I've, That's I've true. <laughs> Scuba dive a little bit. Those tanks are big and heavy. You gotta, you know. As someone that can barely do one push-up, I was very <laughs> impressed. <laughs> yeah, it's good stuff. Um, other stuff they found, um, more clinically relevant things, um, associations of adult leisure time, physical activity, mortality, light physical activity, and uh, 
cardiovascular disease in older women, trends in physical, physical activity, women with CVD, and um, a recent paper, I think this is from the last week or two, on fitness, strength, and metabolites in young men, where they measured all these different things from the metabolome, the newest ohm that we're talking about. Right. I'm not talking about the metabolome, but people <laughs> are, so it's good stuff. Um, next up, you want to talk about measles? Yeah. Um, so this was a study um, that... I was really interested in, of course. <laughs> um, but um, essentially, it was an analytical decision analytical model. And so they looked at a population, a synthetic population in Texas, um, using the 2010 US Census um, and simulated measles transmission um, in a Texas population using um, vaccination rates that they had obtained um, from 2018 school districts and, and schools. Um, and essentially, in the model, they then began to introduce measles cases, cases and varied the uh, or adjusted the um, percentage of people that were vaccinated in those populations to see um, what the impact of that might be. Um, and so, they ultimately found that um, looking at using 2018 vaccination rates, that the median number of cases in large metropolitan areas could be small, um, but that if you decrease the vaccination rates to a certain percent, even just as small as a 5% decrease in current vaccination rates, you could get a 40% to 40,000 percent in a potential outbreak size. Um, and so uh, definitely interesting and very relevant stuff, um, particularly in the setting of um, increasing rates of medical, non-medical uh, vaccination exemptions. Yep, absolutely. And one of the things that, that stood out to me the most was that more than one out of three of the simulated measles cases were in vaccinated kids. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, this is one of those things where we live in a society and uh, public health impacts all of us. Mm -hmm. So uh, non-scientific reasons to um, to not get vaccines are things that can impact all of us. Um, and one of the things, you know, there's a simulation. It's hard to know exactly what to, what to do with it because, you know, it's simulated data. They didn't mm -hmm. actually infect people in Texas with it. But the way the simulation worked, the numbers um, actually that they forecast matched the numbers from what happened in 2006 to 2017, yeah. um, which is a nice little proof of concept here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, with any model, you always have to consider the assumptions that are being made mm -hmm. um, to, to create that model. But, but certainly we saw proof there. So. Right. So I'd say it definitely passes a SNP test and uh, vaccine's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. All right. So moving on, a slightly more optimistic paper on uh, cost effectiveness of uh, housing first intervention uh, combined with intensive case management um, in uh, treating homeless adults with mental illness. This is an economic secondary reanalysis of an RCT they did in Canada uh, a few years ago where they basically randomized uh, homeless individuals who have mental illness to either traditional care where they get kind of usual support in a place like Canada with a pretty robust safety net um, and they would go, you know, go to shelters, get rehab, et cetera, for substance use. Um, but the, the intervention group uh, actually got rental assistance, help finding um, housing. It was pretty robust stuff. They could get housing of their choice. Um, they got uh, case managers where the ratio was, I think it was each case manager had 17 uh, homeless individuals they were helping. Um, and the intervention showed overall pretty pretty good, good work. What what this study looked at was the the economics about of it. And basically they found that um, while overall the cost was about $15,000 a year per person, about uh, there, there's a 46% savings from reducing other services by giving people kind of a better kind of first step and, and better social support. Um, so, so it costs less than $8,000 per person um, overall. Um, it ended up shaking out to about $56 per day uh, to keep somebody stably housed. Um, and overall, you know, that doesn't mean it's free. That doesn't mean it's saving money. Um, but from as far as social interventions go, that certainly seems like a bargain to be able to keep people off the streets for, for less than $60 a day. Definitely. And I, one of the other things that sort of struck me in the discussion is that they mentioned that um, there had been some qualitative assessments as mm -hmm. well and, and found that people that were in the intervention group also reported um, sort of a more positive outlook on their right. life trajectories. Yeah, absolutely. And that certainly makes sense. I mean, the... Uh, you know, unfortunately, in the emergency department, I see probably the people who have, uh, you know, the, the least resources, the least amount of help, the people who are unhappy with the shelters, et cetera, mm -hmm. or, or have mental illness that serves as a barrier, et cetera. Um, and from what I hear, the shelters just are, are, are certainly far from ideal. Um, and it's tough because it's a tough problem. And uh, here uh, in our political landscape, there's also a lot of, I'd say, reluctance to throw resources at certain problems. Mm -hmm. um, which is a whole different issue, which we won't get into today. <laughs> um, 
But next up, uh, Association of Maternal Age with Severe Maternal Morbidity and Mortality in Canada. Uh, this was an interesting use of a Canadian data set using the Canadian Institute for Health Information to look at all pregnant and postpartum women um, in Canada who, who had any interaction with the hospital. This included miscarriages um, and, and ectopic pregnancies. Um, so they had 3.2 million pregnancies during that time, which is, those are always big numbers. Um, 54,000 episodes of severe maternal uh, morbidity and mortality. That included 34 different diagnoses, including eclampsia, postpartum hemorrhage, requiring transfusion. One of the things that's fascinating to me is they explicitly did not include just a plain blood transfusion um, or HIV infection yeah. as, as a morbid, severe morbidity because those are not life-threatening anymore. Yeah, that's which is right. Cool. <laughs> that is um, cool, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that I, I kind of liked and um, that they mentioned, they looked at sort of patient level factors and mm -hmm. hospital level factors, and yep. um, uh, they mentioned that you know hospitals that had lower volumes mm -hmm. of um, pregnancies overall uh, right. ended up having uh, worse outcomes, which I think makes sense. Yep, absolutely. I mean, the, we, the more we find that you know specialized care gets people better care yeah. a lot of the time, um, and this it, it, it certainly makes sense with a lot of this. Uh, a lot of stuff. The other things that shook out were uh, age under 19 or mm -hmm. age over 30, uh, with not surprisingly the biggest risk for uh, age over 45. Um, one of the things that was a, probably a little, uh, I'd say, pessimistic uh, from their data was that there was a 10% increase in severe uh, morbidity and morta mortality from their first year to their last year of this study, um, which I don't know what that means. Um, mm -hmm. I have a hard time believing that we're getting uh, less good at taking care of pregnant women, yeah. and my guess is that it's probably more of a marker of uh, age of pregnancy going higher or higher, traditionally higher risk uh, mothers being more likely to uh, be pregnant, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Potentially, yeah. And I'm just making this up. So <laughs> who knows? Makes sense to me. All right. All right next one up. This one's this was an interesting one. Association of Restless <laughs> Leg Syndrome with uh, Suicide and Self-Harm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, they used true van market scan data, looked at people who were diagnosed by their docs with the rest of the leg syndrome from 2006 to 2014. They had 24,000 specifically non-pregnant uh, people with rest of the leg syndrome. Uh, they matched them to 145,000 age and sex matched uh, uh, other people in the database who didn't have pre-existing uh, suicide attempts, self-harm, CV, uh, cardiovascular disease, or cancer. Um, only found 120 cases of suicide or self-harm, which mm. which. Uh, I guess that's good news, um, but there was an adjusted hazard ratio of 2.7 for restless leg syndrome. Um, and again, we have no idea what that means, whether uh, restless leg syndrome is a cause, you know, is a result of or associated with psychiatric disease like suicide that leads to suicide and self-harm, or if people are literally, you know, be, being driven to self-harm from having yeah. their symptoms. Mm. And they adjusted, I think, in this even for depression yeah. and comorbid conditions, yep. right? And they still found this association. Yep. Yeah. Is, um, pretty interesting. Yeah, and it was interesting to me, I'm not a methodologist, but they did a couple different adjustments, and when they did more adjustments, the association got stronger. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, it's interesting. Uh, it's a hypothesis generator. Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, you want to talk about the last one? Sure. Um, so, this last one, development and implementation of a hands-on surgical pipeline program for low-income high school students. Um, so, this was really interesting. This was mm. a mixed method study, and they looked at um, introducing a summer pipeline program focused on surgery and um, exposing surgical techniques um, or educating um, students uh, in high school um, on surgical techniques. And these were uh, primarily in underrepresented groups. Um, and they first did a local needs assessment, um, and then they partnered with a STEM uh, pipeline program to develop these workshops. And they did a pre and post sort of curriculum survey and found that um, after being exposed to this uh, program that there was more reported self-efficacy and more understanding of healthcare pathways um, mm -hmm. for these students. Yeah, and, and this sounds great. First of all, the name is fantastic. The Summer Math and Science Honors or yeah. SMASH Academy, yeah. which is always, uh, I always like a good acronym. Yep. Um, the, uh, the, I mean, the thing that, that, that to me is so great about this is there's so many things that need to happen for somebody to basically re to get into med school. You yeah. need to, uh, you know, not only do things like do well in college and take the right courses and take the MCATs, but you need to know how to do these things. And before all that, you need to see it as an achievable goal. Mm -hmm. um, I was very lucky. I grew up in nice suburbs. My sister married an ER doctor right right around the time of certain residency. Yeah. Um, this was the kind of stuff where it was, it was clear to me what the path was and that the path was there. 
Um, I've seen both where I went to med school and where I did residency I had also reached out to their uh, community, local communities to try to you know, encourage underrepresented minorities and other less privileged groups to, to get in the pipeline early. Mm -hmm. um, and so to see programs like this, and this one's out of Stanford, uh, which is great because uh, you know, Stanford's a wonderful, beautiful ivory tower that does some you know, leading edge research and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, but there's there's lots of less privileged people in the area, and also want to give a shout out to uh, the senior author Ar Arden Mortis Morris, who is a uh, an associate editor at Gemini Network Open also. So always yeah. see. Um, you know, one thing I did uh, notice with that um, with that today, one of the questions I think was mm. looking at um, sort of what people's feelings were surrounding med mm. school, and I was um, sort of disheartened to see uh, the crushing financial debt uh, yeah. being being one of the the factors that made people a little bit. Worried. Yeah, it's tough. And, you know, I think that's one of those things where uh, obviously it would be better if doctors didn't need to take on so much debt, mm -hmm. but we overall do really well. Yeah. Um, and the debt, you know, I've, I've got, I'd say, for where I am in my career and for, you know, I, I basically got all of my med school paid. I'm paying for it now still. It's all debt. Um, it's all manageable. It's it's something we can do. Uh, doctors do very well. We've got an amazing amount of uh, career security that a lot of yeah. people don't have um, to make it fair amount of money for a very long period of time and get to wear pajamas to work most of the time too, which is very <laughs> nice. Um, so so to see that that is dissuading people from going into a career who may not have other opportunities that are as secure is a little disappointing. Yeah. Um, I actually, looking at the program, the details they did, some of it was really cool. I want to do some of this stuff. But, <laughs> but so, you know, they did a bunch of workshops and like, small yep. group sessions, patient panels. They got to play with um, lap, uh, laparoscopic and robotic uh, robot skills. Uh, yeah. And do some, doing some stuff with resected cadavers. It's it's really cool it's stuff. It's really cool, definitely. Yeah, um, and very cool exposure stuff. Again, I was lucky. Uh, my brother-in-law like, took me around and we did, he piloted a cadaver uh, procedure class that he was developing on me when I was like 16. So wow. I helped yeah. with uh, chest tubes when I was like 16 years old on a cadaver. <laughs> wow. It was really cool. <laughs> so it's fun stuff. Um, all right, so that's what we got today. Um, so thank you, Dr. Desai, for joining us. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's great. Uh, of course, of course, you can read these art these articles and more at GemmaNetworkOpen.com. Uh, our releases are every Wednesday and Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time. Follow us on the social media channels: Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, LinkedIn, everywhere else. Listen to the author segment of our uh, of, of these sessions, these Jana Live sessions, on our uh, podcast. You can get them at uh, Apple Podcasts or wherever else you get podcasts. Um, we should be on next week, Tuesday at 3 p.m. Central again. Uh, Mike will be back, and we'll see. Uh, and have a good Labor Day. Bye. All right. Take care.